Our sermon today is taken from Exodus chapter 9, verses 1 to 12. This is the word of God. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go in to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will fall with a very severe plague upon your livestock that are in the field, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, and the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. And the Lord set a time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. And the next day the Lord did this thing. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one of the livestock of the people of Israel died. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the kiln, and let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. It shall become fine dust over all the land of Egypt, and become boils breaking out in sores on man and beasts throughout all the land of Egypt. So they took soot from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh. And Moses threw it in the air, and it became boils, breaking out in sores on man and beasts. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for their boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them, as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Thus says the Lord. Amen. Thanks, Eric. Friends, uh, let me pray one more time before we continue in our sermon. Father, I beg you that as we open up your word, that you would send your spirit to the hearts and the minds and the ears of those here who are listening so that the message that are spoken uh, may be real and vivid and true in their hearts. For no preacher can ever um, mold words good enough or beautiful enough to penetrate through the, the heart that is in itself hard, but only the work of your spirit can soften it and make it real. We beg you today, above all things, for more mercy. Help us understand and see who you are through this passage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so friends, we're going to continue in our series through the life of Moses. And right now, we're in the middle of the plagues. We're in the part of the story where God's already been telling Pharaoh a few times now to let Israel go, let his people go, right? Yet Pharaoh's been stubborn. He's refused to do so. So God sent Egypt a few plagues. And the purpose of these plagues is not as simple as God just wanting to overthrow Pharaoh with power and, and just to, for Pharaoh to let the people go. As we saw two weeks ago, these plagues had many meanings about them. God is trying to reveal who he is through the way he goes about doing the plagues and all the detail minute of the plagues communicate something. And as we saw two weeks ago, that God, through these plagues, are directly attacking false gods in Egypt. Do you remember that? Plague number one, what did God do? God turned the water in the Nile into blood, right? The Nile was a river that went through Egypt, and the water in the Nile was turned to blood, and that was a direct attack to the false god in Egypt named the god Happy. Happy, if you remember, was a god of the Nile. And the Egyptians believed that Happy was the one that was responsible for the f- annual flooding of the Nile. The water that will then uh, uh, be of great benefit to the agriculture there, and therefore their source of food and income. Happy was their main primary source for comfort. And then, plague number two, God used frogs to attack Egypt. And if you remember with this plague, God was attacking a false goddess in Egypt called Heket. Heket was a goddess that had a frog head. And Heket was the ultimate source for security for Egypt. Why? Because they believed that Heket was the one that was responsible for providing the Egyptians with many children. Okay, when there's a birth, that's also, there's always a scribe to Heket's work. And children are the basis of their future military might. So Heket was their primary source of security. Hapi was their primary source of comfort. And God attacked those two false gods through these um, 
uh, plagues. What God is trying to communicate here or with many of the plagues, not all of them, but many of them, is that once you take a creature and you elevate that creature to God status in your life, meaning that's what idolatry is, right? When you take a creature and you've made that creature the primary source of your comfort, your security, your peace, your identity, okay? Whatever that creature may be, a river or frogs, or like we often do, a romantic relationship, another person, a career, our job, particular social group, whatever creature we elevate to God's status in our life, God is trying to tell us by these plagues that the natural consequences of it is that it's going to mess everything up. Instead of fulfilling you, those things that you've put so much hope in, and I often do too, will end up disappointing and crushing us like the Nile and the frog did to Egypt because nothing can live up to that kind of expectations. And though not all the plagues directly correlate with a false Egyptian god, plague five today, we're on plague five now, I think it does. And here we see God telling us another message about idolatry and the consequences of it, okay? Uh, an idol will not only disappoint and crush you, like the Nile and the frog did to Egypt, but that idol will also, one, be taken away, two, harden your heart, and three, justify God's wrath. Be taken away, harden your heart, and justify God's wrath. Let's go to the first point. The idol will be taken away. Okay, let's start in verse one. You see here God telling Pharaoh again, okay, the same thing he's told him for a while now, you know, goes to Moses, go into Pharaoh and say to him, Moses, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. And if Pharaoh refuses, go to verse 2. God says, plague will fall on the livestock, which are the animals, includes horses, donkeys, camels. The herds literally means cattle or the cows and flocks. Okay. We find here, as many commentaries, and I also think, another Egyptian idol or false god being attacked. And that is the cow god named Hathor. Okay. It is questionable whether or not the cow god is a specific one being attacked here, because unlike the previous plagues that was attacked, God singled them out. It was clear, right? The Nile was singled out by God. Frogs were singled out by God. But this time, cows weren't singled out by God. All the animals were attacked, and cows were just one of the animals, okay? So we might think that it's not really referring to Hathor, but I think it is for a few reasons. One, the Egyptians believed, this is interesting, that the goddess Hathor is actually the mistress of the sun god Ra. So they would have children, and their children are the pharaohs of Egypt, right? And the sun god Ra is going to be attacked by God in plague number nine. Remember when God covers the sun? That's a dig to the sun god Ra. Okay, so there's a connection there between Hathor and Ra. Second reason why I think God specifically attacking Hathor here is because the animals or the cattle here does include cows, and it sticks out, you know? Imagine yourself going to a place or a culture where the cow is upheld to some kind of divine status. The cow has made to be kind of godlike, and then you go there, and then you kill 10 different kinds of animals, including all of their cows. The fact that other animals were involved doesn't mask the offense, it actually heightens it. Because what you're actually saying is you're going to treat this idolized, God-made cow no different than all the other animals. You see? The fact that you included other animals doesn't decrease the offense. It actually heightens it. But third, the most convincing reason for me is, is uh, why uh, Hathor is specifically in view the cow god here is because the Egyptians believed that the cow goddess Hathor is responsible to bringing people across the realms from death to life. That's Hathor's responsibility. And notice something specific about this plague. It's something interesting. See, in comparison to the plagues before, stick with me now, the plagues before, God used the, the idol to bring about destruction. You see? God used the Nile to bring about destruction. God used the frogs to bring about destruction. But here, it's different. Notice, God didn't cause the cows to run around the city and destroy Egypt. He didn't use the idol to destroy Egypt. What did he do? 
He simply took it away. He killed them right then and there. There's a few purposes for that. One, I believe this is an attack to Hathor. God here is declaring to Pharaoh and to Egypt that he is the only one responsible for the crossing of realms, not this goddess Hathor. He is. But two, the purpose of God directly taking the cows away is I think God again is revealing to us another consequence of idolatry. Okay. Do you remember, if you weren't here, let me give you a recap. Two weeks ago, we talked about in plagues number one and two with the Nile and with the, the frog, um, the consequence of idolatry is that whatever that created thing you've elevated to God's status in your life, okay, it's going to destroy you. It's going to disappoint you, just like the Nile and the frog destroyed and disappointed Egypt. Okay, God's trying to communicate that. When we elevate created things to God's status, they'll end up disappointing and destroying us. And the analogy I used two weeks ago is of your career and kids, right? If you put your careers and kids to a level of God's status, if you demand your career or your kids, which is the examples I use, to give you only things that God can, purpose, meaning, identity, then, like the Nile and the frog, it will disappoint you. It will crush you because nothing can live up to that kind of expectation. Nothing can handle to be the main source of your identity, meaning, and purpose. Only God can handle that kind of weight. And now, what God is saying here with this plague is that when we elevate created things to God's status, in this case the cow, not only will it disappoint and crush us as the Nile and the frog did Egypt, but also the thing we've elevated to God's status in your life it'll be taken away from us as the cow was directly taken away from Egypt. So what do you mean? Like, if I idolize my career, I'm going to get fired? Or if I idolize my kids, my kids are going to run away? No, not necessarily like that. Let's stick with those two examples, career and kids, okay? When your job and your career becomes the main place you've measured worth and value in, you'll lose your job. Not because you'll get fired. Many people who idolize their jobs actually do very well and excel in their jobs. But you'll still lose it. How? Because now, it's no longer a job. You see, if a job becomes the main place you measure your worth and value in, when you elevate that to God's status, when you walk in into the office, therefore, every morning, you're no longer walking into an office filled with coworkers to do a job. You know what you're walking into now? You're walking into a courtroom filled with judges who has the power to determine your worth. It stopped being a job. It's now a courtroom. You've lost it. Now it's no longer a job that you're supposed to work so that you can have money to pay your bills. You've lost that. You've turned that into a courtroom where you must prove your worth, where your value and sense of self is under judgment every single day based on how well you do that day and based on what your coworkers think of you. Let's do the children example. When you elevate your kids to God's status, you'll lose them. How? Well, when your kids' success become the main place that you find identity in, you've lost your kids because you've turned them into something else. You've turned them into your public relations representative. You see? And you'll begin to treat them as such. No longer are they children to endure and be patient with and love and sacrifice and care for but now there are people whose reputations will ultimately determine your identity and you've lost them, but you've gained a PR representative. It goes for everything. Whatever you elevate to God's status, you've turned into something else. Naturally, you'll lose it as it was meant to be. Elevate medicine to that status, right? You'll lose them. Elevate medicine to your primary source of comfort that is seeds of addiction. You'll lose that thing that was originally meant to heal and serve you because you've turned it into a master that now enslaves you. Elevate books to that level. You'll lose your books. Those books that was originally meant to teach you and make you humble and wise, you've turned them into cognitive dumbbells that you pick up 
in order to gain brain muscle so that you can show off to others. You've lost your books. Elevate a healthy body to that level. You'll lose it. A body shape that's meant to be a sign of health and moderation instead now becomes a shame-based goal that actually leads you to all kinds of unhealth. You'll lose it. Elevate church ministry to that level. You'll lose it. A position, an institution that's meant to serve others marked by love is now turned into a banner of self-promotion marked by competition. Name it. Name it. Anything you elevate to God's status in your life, you will lose it. As Egypt lost the cows. Now, here's what's important to notice. Another key point of the passage. So far, I've spoken of the process of loss as if it's merely a natural result or a natural consequence of our idolatry, which is true, but we can't miss this. There's something else God is saying. He's saying that this loss you experience is not just a result of mere natural consequences. It is also a direct curse from God himself. Look again at verse 3. What did Moses say? Behold, mere natural consequences will take away your cattle? No. He said, behold, the hand of the Lord will take away your cattle. That's a bit terrifying, you know? Because this means whenever those losses happened, which I think it's safe to say that all of us here has experienced that in one way or another, our passage is saying when, when that loss happens, that's not just a natural consequence of idolatry. Those losses is first and foremost a form of judgment intentionally and directly administered by the hand of God. Is that a scary thought? Absolutely. See, God is declaring himself here not only to be the authority over life and death, but also the just judge for all creation. His hands will personally see that justice is fulfilled and that sin is answered for. But then, immediately, as soon as God reveals his justice in verse 3, God reveals his mercy in verse 4. Look at verse 4 with me. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die, which is exactly what happens in verses 5 and 6. None of the livestock of Israelites died. This, friends, is mercy. Well, you might ask, how do we know it's mercy? How do we know that the Israelites weren't just better people than the Egyptians? How do we know maybe the Israelites deserve this kind of treatment from God? Maybe it wasn't mercy. Maybe it's what they deserved. It's not and they don't deserve this kind of treatment from God. Why? How do I know? Because the Bible says so. Let me read you Romans chapter 9, verses 14 to 19. What shall we say then? It's in, the, it's in the PowerPoint, I believe. Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel of honorable use and another for dishonorable use? This is profound. Because the New Testament is saying that both, both Moses and Pharaoh, both Egypt and Israel, came from what? They came from the same lump of clay. They're the same. Not one is better than the other. So then why does Israel not receive God's judgment when they do deserve God's judgment, when they are of the same clay? Why were they protected from it? That's mercy. That's grace. To those whom God wants for himself, his hand will not fall upon them with heavy judgment, but rather will uphold and preserve them, not because they deserve it, 
but because of mercy. Let me just sidetrack here a little bit. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation, right? Because as Christians today, experientially, you might still experience the natural consequences of your idolatry, okay? Your cows, so to speak, might still be taken away. If we go to work and we uh, treat our work as the place where we find our ultimate sense of self and worth, you've lost a job, right? It's been taken away, and instead you've gained a courtroom that judges you. And if you feel anxiety, if you feel tiredness, if you feel frustration, if you feel insecurity from that act, that's a natural consequence of our idolatry. We all still experience something like that. But yet what God is assuring us of here is that if that happens to you as a Christian, as somebody who's received God as, his, as Christ as Lord and Savior, though you might still experience the natural consequences of your idolatry, this passage is saying, be rest assured, God's not doing it because he's driven by wrath and judgment. He's doing it to you. He's allowing you to experience it because of his mercy to mold you, to shape you, to give you a taste of how repulsive your idolatry is. Aren't you sick of it? Doesn't it taste bad? In hope that you'd come back and run back to him as the prodigal son did to the father after he's tasted the food meant for pigs. Those natural consequences of idolatry may feel like a sharp knife to you, Christian. Yet if you receive Christ, it's not a knife that comes from an angry executioner but rather from a caring surgeon who's doing meticulous work in your soul. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, as we sung earlier in our hymn, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee. There's still flame, see? But it shall not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Rest assured. Okay, back to the passage. Both Egypt and Israel deserve justice, deserve wrath. They come from the same lump of clay, but yet Israel instead received mercy and Egypt, justice. And this theme of some receiving mercy and others justice continue in our passage today. Our second point, idolatry will harden your heart. Okay, for the second point, we're only gonna cover verse seven. That's it. Why? Because this one verse, I think, is a huge theme in the plague narratives and also it's, I think, a sensitive one, okay? And it's worth taking a whole point just for this one verse. We see here in verse 7, the reason why Pharaoh was so rebellious to God is why. Look at it. Why is Pharaoh so rebellious to God? It's because his heart was hard, right? At the end of every plague, the author mentions Pharaoh's heart becomes harder and harder and harder. But the question is, let me ask you this, okay? Here's what's confusing about it. Who hardened it? The, the wording here is kind of vague. All it says is that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And intuitively, we may think that Pharaoh did the hardening, but you can't assume that. You can't assume Pharaoh hardened his own heart. All it says is that it was hardened. So I did some deep research on this just for you guys because you're special. And it's interesting to see that when referring to Pharaoh's heart, in the English, it says harden, okay? That's all you will see in, in the ESV and other translations is harden. But originally in the Hebrew, it's actually two, there's three different Hebrew words, words but the one we used here is the two words, kabed and hazak, two different Hebrew words that are both translated to the word harden, okay? Let me explain what they are. Kabed means weight. So the connotation is that Pharaoh's heart became so dense. You know when something increases in density, it also increases in weight? Right? It becomes weighty. Pharaoh's heart was kabed. The, the second term is hazak. Hazak has more of a connotation of firmness. Not firmness in density, but firmness in resolve. You know when somebody calls you a hard head? Like you have a hard head? It's not that, they don't mean that your head literally became more dense and harder, right? Maybe it did. I don't know. But what they mean is that your resolve is set. Right? You're firm in your convictions. Right? You're hard, you have a hard head. So one is kabed, weighty. Two is hazak, firmness of direction. In verse 7, when it says Pharaoh's heart was hardened, the word hardened there is the first one, kabed, which means weighty. Now, here's what's interesting. Okay. You know what the word for glory is in the Old Testament? It's kavod. You know what it literally means if you translate it to English? Weight. 
So when the Old Testament talks about God's kavod, it talks about God's weightiness, God's glory, God's weightiness. Okay, so, so here, the Hebrew word to describe God's glory, kavod, weightiness, has the same meaning as what happened to Pharaoh's heart as it became kabed, weightier. Okay, who is it in this Exodus story that Pharaoh has elevated more than anything else into God's status. Ultimately, he didn't elevate the frog to God's status. Ultimately, he didn't elevate the Nile to God's status or cows. You know who he elevated to God's status in this story? Himself. He's placed himself in the position of God. He's idolized himself. And what happens, friends? When a mere man fancies themselves as God, when a mere man thinks that their reasoning, their desires, their preferences, their definition of right or wrong trump God's word, they elevate themselves to God's status. And what happens is that they can't handle that glory, that kavod, that weight. You know what it'll do? It'll only make their hearts harder, kavod, weightier. The natural consequence of wanting the weight of glory is that the human heart will become more and more weighty and hard toward God, the only one who deserves all glory. Now, but again, this, as same as point one, so far I've been talking about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart here as if it's merely a natural consequence of self-glory, as if it's merely a natural consequence of idolizing the self, but that's not, all, not, not at all it. Go down to verse 12. Who hardened Pharaoh's heart? It's no longer a question here. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. See, the fact that you lose things, like I talked about in point one, the fact that you lose things you've elevated to God's status is both the natural consequence of idolatry, but ultimately is the act of God's justice personally administered by his hand. The fact that your heart becomes hard when you elevate yourself to God's status is the natural consequence of self-idolatry, yes, but ultimately it's an act of God's justice. He hardened it. By the way, throughout the plague narrative, God is described to have hardened Pharaoh's heart 16 times. And Pharaoh is described to have hardened his own heart only three times. Who did it? The hardening of Pharaoh's heart is, at the end of the day, an act of judgment God has upon idolaters. See, the only reason why we may not think this is fair, that God in his judgment hardened Pharaoh's heart, but yet in his mercy did not harden the Israelites' heart, soften their hearts. The reason why we might think it's not fair is because I think that we still think everyone starts off with a clear record I think we still somehow believe that everybody starts off with a blank slate. But remember what we saw in Romans chapter 9. Both Pharaoh and Israel started from what? The same lump of clay. What kind of clay? A sinful one. Romans 3, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Psalm 51, in iniquity I was born, the psalmist says. We don't start with a clean slate. We don't start at neutral. We start with a heart that is naturally, like Pharaoh's, hard toward God. You're right. It's not fair. It's not fair that God would punish Pharaoh and not punish Israel. But the unfairness doesn't lie with how God treated Pharaoh. The unfairness lies with how God treated Israel. It's not fair that God doesn't punish Israel. He should have. He should have punished them because they were sinful. They started off in the same lump of clay. They were all deserving of God's wrath and judgment. The fact that Israel did not receive the plagues, the fact that if you read plague number four, the flies didn't cover Israel, the fact that their cattle here didn't die. You're right, that's not justice. That's mercy. That's grace. If God is to be fully fair, if God is to be truly just, then all of Israel would have been wiped clean 
covered with flies. Their cattle would have died too. They're of the same lump of clay as Egypt, as Pharaoh. Tremble, be careful when you demand God's justice. The wise man begs for his mercy. So, in view of God's judgment in this light, I think it changes a lot of the difficulties that we have about it, which leads us to our last point. Idolatry justifies God's wrath. It justifies it. He's not being mean. He's being fair. Look at verses 8 to 9. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the kiln, and let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. It shall become fine dust over all the land of Egypt and become boils. Boils are like skin disease, right? Breaking out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. What's happening here in plague number six, we're in plague number six now, is God told Moses, go to the kiln, kiln is like a furnace, and take soot from it. Soot is like ash, okay? Remember back then, Pharaoh cruelly enslaved Israel and forced them to make bricks to build his own kingdom. In order to make these bricks, the Israelites had to put the material in a kiln, in a furnace, so that when it's heated up, it becomes hard and brick-like. And in that furnace, you have leftovers. You know those black ashes you find in a furnace after you burn something? There's leftovers of that. God specifically told Moses to take that ash from that furnace, which symbolizes the suffering of Israel, and throw it in the air. And when the wind blew the ash unto the Egyptians, it turned into skin disease, which back then skin disease symbolized spiritual uncleanliness, like um, uh, leprosy, right? It symbolizes spiritual uncleanliness. What, what, what's happening here, what God's saying here is he's emphasizing you, Egypt, Pharaoh, you're unclean because of a direct consequence of your actions. You did this, look at the ash, it will cause you this. It's an eye for an eye. You've done A, you deserve B. This is justice. This isn't evil. This isn't undue wrath. This is deserved justice. Whatever you're experiencing now, Pharaoh, whatever natural consequence of idolatry you're experiencing, whatever personal judgment I have placed upon you for your idolatry, all of it, all of it is fair. This is what justice looks like. There's a contradiction, I think, in the human heart. We want absolute justice in the world, do we not? You see that everywhere, the fact that we have police forces and we have judges voted into office, the fact that we have whole legal systems set in place, it shows us that in somewhere in there, the human nature desires justice to be valued and held upright highly. Everyone wants justice to reign, but yet when we talk about a God who is fully just, who is fully fair, who will hold all of us accountable to our actions, all of a sudden, our hearts become unsettled. You see the contradiction? We want the concept of justice, but yet we reject the worldview that concept is based upon. We want the concept, we want the benefits without admitting the worldview. Why is that? Well, I, I think because deep inside we realize that kind of absolute justice, that kind of justice that punishes even the slightest sin, that kind of justice, it would implicate us as well, wouldn't it? And don't you know it, everyone becomes very vocal about justice when someone else is implicated. But we all become much less vocal about it when we are the recipients of it. God is saying here, friends, whether we like it or not, he will reign with full justice and wrath, and it will be upheld, whether we like it or not. All sin, all that falls short of the glory of God, will be held into account. So then, the big unanswered question from point number one, how can and why was Israel off the hook? <laughs> How did they not receive God's justice? Were they not made of the same lump of clay as Pharaoh? Yeah, they were. Were they not sinful? Yes, they were. Does not 
the whole book of Exodus over and over again portray their rebellion against God? Remember, they cursed God just a few chapters ago. And then you'd think after God frees them, they would fall in love with God. No, no, they curse God again after the Red Sea. They're sinful. They're made of the same lump of clay as Pharaoh, as Egypt. So then why would they not affected by the plagues? Why did their cattle not die? Why did the flies in plague number four not cover them? Why was their skin in plague number six not covered in boils? Did God relax his sense of justice? Did God just kind of ignore it when it comes to his people? Absolutely not. He can't do that. He's God. So then where did God's justice and wrath for his people go? Where did it go? Friends, I'll let the Bible answer its own question. Romans 5. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We have now been justified by his blood. Where did all that wrath go? Where did that justice go? How can God's heavy hand pass over his people because it was laid upon Christ. It was put upon himself till on that Christ as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Every sin on him was laid. Here the Christian can say, in the death of Christ, I live. Death, which is both the natural consequence of our idolatry and also the judgment of God upon idolaters, was swallowed up by Jesus so that you may live. That's who your God is, but that's not all. That's not all. The mercies of God in this passage goes further still. If, you've, if you're sitting here today and you've received Christ as Lord and Savior, let me ask you, why is that? Why is your heart not hard like Pharaoh's? Was it because you softened it yourself? Why is it when you heard the word of God proclaimed like Pharaoh did, you received the gospel and you did not reject it. Did you soften your own heart? No. The reason why you received it, the reason why you have a soft heart, Christian, if you are made of the same lump of clay as Pharaoh, must mean, therefore, that God, in his mercy, softened it instead of, in his justice, harden it. This is bizarre. This means not only did God make a way for you to be saved, but God also made certain that you would receive it. That's how in intentional he is about having you. For the payment was paid by him and the soft heart which received it was molded by him. The gospel, friends, it leaves no room for self-glory to enter into any crevice of the heart. Because not the payment, nor the ability to receive the payment was sourced from within us. Every minute aspect of your salvation and mind was initiated by, accomplished through, and purposed for the glory of the one God. That's what your salvation is for. That's why you're saved. So Christian, leave our idols behind. Leave them, yes, because if we idolize something, we're going to lose them, yes. Yes, because our idolatry offends the holy and just God and brings about his wrath. But Christian, for the Christian, for the one who's received God's grace on that cross, the reason why you leave your idols behind is because you've been captured by mercy so great. You've been captivated by love so deep. You've been united to a God so glorious and you've been saved by the death of a Savior so gracious. The reason why you leave your idols behind is because once you were dead in your sin and now you are alive through his death, live now in that newness of life. Let us lay aside every weight, Paul says, every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. 
Christian, seek no more glory for yourself. You can't handle it. Save the throne that is his to him alone. Your job is not to be God or to make gods. Your job is to serve the living God who came down and served you even unto a cross. Live now in that newness of life. Let's pray. Father, help your word that is preached be delivered by your spirit to the hearts of your people so that your church may be built up in the likeness of your son for your glory. Remind our stubborn, hard heads and hard hearts that life, salvation, and all therein is for the purpose of your majesty, that all the world may see who you are, your justice, your righteousness, your holiness, and oh, Father, your love, your mercy, your grace. You've taken a people for yourself who do not deserve it. You've adopted a people for yourself who by their own righteousness deserve otherwise. How glorious is our God. And now, Father, we can sing all glory be to him. And as we run this race, knowing the victory has been won on that cross. And when we see you face to face, the one who's died for our sins, we can say, praise be to God for the salvation was Christ, not me. In his name we pray, amen.